Let's get started. Uh, thank you for attending this panel conversation. Uh, this is this is an interesting one. Uh, this panel is called Continuous Delivery Paradox, how to balance speed uh, with value. And I'm hoping that we are going to have a very passionate, if somewhat controversial, <laughs> uh, topics that will come up because I personally know all, all of these members on the panel and they are an extremely fun bunch to have. Uh, it's hard to corral them, so it'll be interesting. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Garima Bajpai. Um, I'm sure all of you know, know her. She's the founder of the DevOps community at Canada and she's also the chair of the ambassador uh, program here at the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Um, she does a lot of other things. In her day job, in a night job, um, uh, travels all over the place. She's a published author. It's like an amazing person to work with. Uh, the next one is Carl Coriel Martin. Uh, Carl has several roles. He's held several roles. He comes with over 22 years of experience, um, improving organizations, their processes, uh, the helping with the people and the culture aspect of things. Um, he's more into services around product market fit around strategic uh, processes, tooling, modernizing organizations. Uh, in his most uh, recent role, uh, Carl has been the CTO at Delving, and I've had the honor of working with Carl at Pivotal and then VMware. Uh, last but not least, we have Rick Clark. He serves as the global head of cloud advisory at UST. Uh, he's a technologist and a strategist, and he has also more than 20 years of experience. Um, leading in cloud, open source, Linux, and other things. Um, he created the number one cloud operating system, so it's Ubuntu server. Um, so that's one of his claims to fame. Uh, the next one is he decided he was a little bored and went to Rackspace and then uh, co-founded OpenStack. Yeah, we don't talk about that one as much. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. Uh, and then he's uh, worked as the SPP of uh, cloud infrastructure at MasterCard, and then VP at Reliance Geo in India, and he helped build one of the largest um, infrastructure in telecommunication. Um, so so that's, that's an amazing thing. So I'm really happy uh, to have you on the panel. And um, so, like I said, they have, I think, combined about 70 years of experience um, in the industry. Uh, I'm your moderator, Gautam Palapa. I'm an executive advisor at VMware. I work with uh, C-suite and executives. I've also uh, led a lot of global teams with mission-critical workloads, things like Enhanced 911 for all of North America, um, various uh, government organizations, uh, notifications, conferencing collaboration, and so on. So um, this kind of topic is really passionate to all of us. Uh, for us, it's uh, at least for me, it's all about improving the quality of human life using technology, because that's one of the primary reasons why we are technologists and we are passionate. So um, coming to this conference and driving and listening to all the talks about uh, continuous delivery is something amazing and really passionate to all of us here. So um, having said all that, I want to jump right in. And to prime the pump, uh, I'm going to ask the first question to you, Garima. Um, so the first question is, what are some pet peeves or common mistakes that teams embrace or adopt when adopting continuous delivery and how can they be avoided? So thank you, Gautam. Uh, as Gautam mentioned that I am a community leader, so I would start with one of the biggest uh, points I can refer to is we actually overlook uh, burnout and frustration. And it is a serious issue. And if you think about it, how and what happens, why we do that as leaders, is uh, the technology first approach. You know, tools come before people. You know, uh, and that is one of the biggest pitfalls I have seen through my journey of continuous delivery adoption. Another thing which I would also like to refer to is competing priorities, you know? As senior leadership, uh, I would say that uh, we spend 80% of our time in consensus building, and after that, we have competing priorities, which results into burnout and frustration. 
there is another aspect of it and i, I this is my own experience through the continuous uh, delivery journey over years that uh, once we align and build consensus there is limited uh, evolution happening during adoption so there is you know the approach towards uh, you know the product oriented mindset is not settled in so people don't think about roadmaps they don't think about the evolution journey and this adoption if you think about it in the context of a big enterprise it can take you years and what it leads you to is after like 4 5 years you're still on that journey and you have not achieved the business goals you have laid out for yourself so these are some of the uh, you know adoption challenges which results into you know not creating that envisioned business value which you have crafted for yourself in the beginning of this journey that's that's great thank you and and uh, i want to add on to it a little bit i mean so we as humans we look at our goals and things we want to accomplish as outcomes as road maps and things we want to strive to but somehow when we go into the organization or when we look at all these transformation things they suddenly become projects they become milestones and they become checkpoints and so there there is that sudden shift in the look and view of things so uh, carl or rick who wants to jump in i'll, about... I'll jump in oh, what you were about to do too but um so I, i like all the people stuff talking about you know the people being important but i'm going to i guess could have ride the line a little bit uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes I see and continue to see is that pipelines are not self-sufficient. And I think Log4j really exposed that 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 people were building things that required someone from the outside to do something. They weren't declarative. Like things need to be declarative and automated. So back to the 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 technical things and everything needs to be declarative. If you if you if you built a system, a CI and a CD system and you're requiring developers to build images for you, then you've made a mistake and when log4j happened you have you're waiting for people to do things and there are many things like that that make it not self sufficient not isolated so that that would be sort of my primary thing i'm always grumpy when people haven't talked with security They're like okay we want to do continuous delivery and they invest in building out automation infrastructure mm -hmm. and then at the end they're like okay now we need to validate that it's secure and it's like well that's still a quarterly review and then people don't talk to finance and it's like okay we fund these things on an annual funding cycle so when we think about like the continuous delivery like what is your cycle time where is the start it's like well when does that feature get funded and then what's your lead time from when it's funded to when it can actually be built and when it can start work so yeah and to finish this point i think uh, i uh, take this back to the people aspect because when you think about speed speed is a complicated factor too in this journey and it leads to innovation gap you know people need time to think innovate experiment follow, uh, follow through their experiments and also if let's say you fail in your journey you need to, to take that time out to retrospect so that i think uh, one of the biggest challenges in the continuous delivery journey when i talk about like large enterprises the innovation gap Yeah, there there are a number of organizations um, that I that I interact with where uh, sometimes there's no permission or there's not even time to have that innovation sprint or have time for yourself to actually um, you know do a retrospective and and introspect on why the thing happened. Um, Garima used the word failure, so obviously one of the things about DevOps is to fail often, fast, and cheap. Um, I I like to not use the word failure because for me a failure means that. it was a waste uh, for me i like to use the word unintended outcomes um, <laughs> because that's truly what it is you learn a lot from something that you thought you would get but did not happen so your it's, hypothesis it's it's rapid like, unscheduled disassembly there, there you go yeah so um, but you're learning a lot from it and i think in enterprises at least especially those that are trying to switch and trying to catch on and deliver things faster especially over the last 36 months um they do not have the luxury of time which actually goes into my second question is uh, and this is for you Carl because i know you're very passionate about this how do you balance the need for speed with the need to maintain high quality code and minimize that risk well first of all i don't like to talk about speed because <laughs> speed is a scaler 
So it, uh, and the direction that the team or the people are going is like as or more important than any sense of the velocity at which they're getting somewhere. So you need to have some confidence that you're building something useful before you can even talk about the speed of delivery. The second thing is that I only talk about speed because I find it tends to um, build walls between people because it's a slice of like people, I like to trust that the people working on the product are doing their best and being professional. And so like, oh, hey, I, want, I want you to work harder. I want you to work faster. It's like, well, if I knew how to work faster, I'd already be doing it. So you're insulting my professionalism and saying that I'm lazy or I'm not doing things that I should be doing. So I find that that sort of talking about speed sort of breaks the conversation in two ways. And so I think the more interesting thing is to sort of talk about, well, what is the chunk size? So how big a piece of work are we doing and we make that smaller? What is the waste? Like what are we building that we don't need to be building? What are activities we can get rid of? And so I find that sort of taking the conversation around speed and sort of asking questions about what do you mean? There's a big thing going on right now that a lot of executives are feeling like, oh, my teams are really slow. And there's some very interesting things going on in software. It's like, why does it feel slow? Um, I blame JavaScript frameworks in a substantial part. <laughs> They're terrible. Um, and, but when you start talking about like, well, what is the pain that you're feeling when you talk about speed and start teasing that out into the chunk size, like delivering things sooner. And then you start to talk about quality and oftentimes delivering small pieces more frequently increases quality. But that also is ideally a, a a conversation between the people building the systems and the people paying for that are like, well, how much quality do you want? Like, what is the appropriate level of quality for this? What is the appropriate level of risk and appropriate level of reliability? And, you know, speed is easier to measure and easier to game than How quality. do you measure speed well, in software? Well, what that, units, that, no, what you, units does you it can, have? You can measure something that you call speed, but I'm getting into the next question already. <laughs> no, but, no, but, but, but hang on. So. There are two different things, and I'd like us to at least make the differentiation of speed versus velocity, right? Yes. Speed is how quickly I can make a particular widget. It doesn't have to move from one place mm -hmm. to another, but how quickly I can make that particular widget or modify it or transform it in some way. So how quickly I can run 10 tests that just assert and say, yep, I did it, cool, that is speed. But velocity is that I've approved it, and it can actually go to the next stage because I've had the right amount of test coverage, and I'm confident enough that it can go to the next stage, and that becomes velocity. Well, instead, instead of speed, why don't I say, say quantity? Quantity versus quality. Like how Lines many times, of code. Yeah, how many times you deploy versus the quality of those deployments. Counterpoint, YAML. I'm going to be amazingly productive because I have 10,000 lines of YAML now if I work in a Kubernetes environment, right? <laughs> So, okay, sorry. <laughs> As you so, can see. The more I, YAML, I, the better. I'm, like, that's I'm, I'm sorry, I'll just to sort of package up the answer to the question, like I, I try to pivot the conversation and understand like what are your real business concerns? Like you feel a conflict here and you're talking about speed and things feel slow. Like let's tease that apart into things we can actually like talk to people in a respectful way. Yeah. Um, and find waste or like are we building the wrong thing or are we spending too much time trying to get React to work because we didn't turn on strict mode at the beginning of the project, uh, for example. <laughs> so, um, so that actually goes into the next question, which is about measuring. How do you measure? What are the metrics and how do you know that you're successful? So, for example, we hear all these stats everywhere, like company X deployed a thousand times, like almost everyone has embraced the Dora metrics and they think that that is the end all be all of all the measures. Uh, but there are, there are only some dimensions that the Dora metrics are going to measure and one of them is the deployment frequency, right? If anyone's attended Leeds talks, he went through every one of them, all five of them. <laughs> um, so company X says that it deploys like 1,000 times in a day, and so it's super cool, and it does that. And then another company says, we have automated like 85 to 90% of our pipeline, and so we hardly have any manual friction in between. So does that mean that they're successful? What exactly are the true measures or metrics that we need to look at when we want to claim that we're successful in a continuous delivery journey? And uh, Rick, you've had experience building this in a number of large-scale organizations. Um, so I'd like you to um, start on this um, to talk about what do you actually consider as success metrics in a CD? 
Well, so I, I don't think there's one answer. I think that your, the metrics that you should measure are what, based on the problem that you're trying to solve. Well, and that problem, the technical problem, should be based on what your business problem and business outcome you want. And, I, I, and the reason I mentioned earlier about gaming things about quantity over, over quality is I've seen um, at very large companies executives say that we're going, to, we're going to set our OKR as how many times we deploy. And then that, that goes down to the development managers who now say, OK, you need to deploy your comments separately from your, I mean, they, they make sure they meet their goals. It, it had nothing to do at this company. They had a quality problem. Right. So how often you release a piece of crap doesn't tell you anything. I, I, I want to accentuate on that and underscore it because I've actually had some developers who just used to commit string changes or front-end element color changes as deployment and check a box saying that, yep, I did a deployment. And I want, I want to add to that. If you're using yes, a feature flag, you can deploy one character at a time and then turn on the feature flag when you're done. And I've deployed a thousand times. And, and you know, I know it sounds like a joke, but if you're an executive and your $200,000 bonus is riding on that, that's what they do. People do, they behave like you compensate them to behave. That's a lot of Amazon interest to run all those tests. <laughs> your Amazon sales are very happy to support that test infrastructure. So I think on a serious note, uh, what we are alluding to is two aspects. The first aspect is uh, the context. You know, uh, how you measure things is very important uh, uh, that you have a context towards, you know, what you're measuring. I break it down into three parts when we talk about continuous delivery. Um, there are, this is, continuous delivery is an ecosystem of producers, consumers, and practitioners. So if you think about the producers of continuous delivery tools, technology, practices, I think the primary goal of this is to um, unlock new revenue streams. When you think about like um, the, the practitioners, the primary goal is to avoid waste and to build technology which is connected to the business imperative. So um, I would like to challenge a little bit on how uh, we have to go beyond DORA and what are the changes which are needed to happen in terms of measuring things. Uh, I think it's time for us to pivot and see what are the next generation matrices we have to build. So Carl, hold on to that thought for a second, if you don't mind, please. Um, I actually want to do an audience poll right now, a raise of hands. How many of you measure something other than DORA? What business KPIs or measures um, uh, do you guys measure? Do, you, do, do any of you do? anything beyond. So feel free, raise your hands. Let's all participate. Oh. Two? Okay. Three? I see three. Four? Nice. Okay. Any business KPIs in that? Non-technical? There's one? Okay. It's actually better than I expected. Yeah. So, all right. So, so that's the point again. I mean, like we're so focused on the technology portion of things, we forget the why. We forget why exactly we're doing all these things. What is the purpose? What is the drivers? How does this connect to the company's success, to the organization's success? At the end of the day, how does this actually improve the customer? Um, and that, that's that's something that um, that Garima also brought up because that there seems to be a disconnect somewhere. Kyle, sorry, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's no, great. I, I just wanted to throw in that I've I love the Dora metrics as a hygiene metric, and you know it's sort of like how often you brush your teeth or how often you take a shower. It's like okay, like if you don't brush your teeth and you don't take a shower, you're likely to have real problems down the road. But at some point, like you know, it is the case of like, are you building a happy life or making money? And so it's like, all right, like let's get this out of the way as a hygiene metric of like, are we doing these basic fundamental things? And then we can start talking about what is the business value we're creating? Are we making money? Are we actually headed in a valuable direction at speed? Nice. Delivering very small pieces of value on an incremental basis. What, what, what is the, you know, so we talked about delivering a uh, character at a time. What is the size that is useful? I mean, I have an idea that, 
that at least at least in early stages, as you're becoming more mature in your CD capabilities, that it needs to be small enough that you understand and can learn and can quickly find a problem. And if it breaks something, you know exactly what it is. Right? If it's smaller than that, that it doesn't. It, it, you don't learn anything from it. And if it's too big, it's too difficult to figure out. That that would be my. But are there other ways people decide how big of a chunk you deploy at a time? I mean, how, how are those decisions being made? Uh, it, it is an interesting question. Um, I'll give my takes and then the rest of you all, and then I'll open it up to the, the audience because I'd like to hear from all of you. I'm happy to run around with the mic. Um, so what I have seen is it eventually ends up in your user story. And so the size of, or the chunk of whatever you're deploying becomes part of that user story. It depends upon how you're writing it, be it uh, BRD or something in um, Atlas in Jira or something where you're flushing it out, a pivotal tracker if you're still using it. Uh, but that becomes the atomic size of something. It's usually a feature or a function that can be consumed by a customer. That's what I've seen. And I want to add this uh, point here that uh, probably we are not at a stage of generalizing the incremental size mm. of the deliveries because of the fact that we haven't been able to create those feedback loops which are required. If you talk about progressive delivery, mm. I think uh, there is more work to be done in that area in order to ensure we have that maturity to define that incremental size. Yeah. Grima works with test infrastructure that involves warehouses full of radios, and so that <laughs> feedback loop takes a long time. I spent a lot of time working in cases where like, the feedback loop is nearly free and that you're pushing to like, a Heroku-style infrastructure. And sort of my answer for like, I've been so happy on Teams and we've been doing like, a deploy every every like pair day or half pair day. So we do a lot of pair programming and like try to wrap up atomic pieces of work. It's sort of like yeah. So it comes back one to one or two times a day. Yeah, it comes back to the question like, did you feel accomplished uh, by delivering that incremental uh, you know and taking that stab on it? What is that quick win which you established through that? So at the end of the day, it can be different for different industry segments, different maturity levels, and different sizes of the company. So I'd like to tweak your wording a little bit, only because he started with the feature flags and the individual characters. Like feeling accomplished <laughs> is probably not enough. I think, did you feel that you have generated value? Mm is probably going to be the qualifier, not just did you accomplish, because every time you deploy, as a developer, I mean, I've been a developer, every time I check in core, I feel accomplishment. I'm like, oh shit, I did something <laughs> awesome, right? And I get that serotonin, I get that dopamine, and so I feel happy and I feel accomplished, but I think if I deploy something that actually generates value, I think putting that as a quantifier, uh, qualifier up front is probably going to be much more effective. And there's a this is really interesting that like these you you can offer value to some of your users and that you know by there's a real temptation oftentimes I've experienced this of like I want to hold off until I have something that sort of is a more complete product and by doing so you are depriving those humans on earth that would have benefit from that incremental product and many of those people exist and it's like okay like that really shitty one tenth implementation that I got done in three days. Like I can put them in the hands in three days and start, they can start deriving value from that now rather than waiting six weeks or eight weeks until I get a bigger package that'll give more users value. And then I can incrementally deliver on top of that. I would challenge the, the idea that, that most developers care about value. I think everyone here is an outlier. Like, like <laughs> the, well, and, and I, I've not, I, would, I, have, I have data. Um, so the, the the fact that we're sitting in here and we came to this and we care enough to be here learning about this makes us outliers, right? There, there are many, many, many developers in the world. Most of them don't come to these. Like, so we have a desire and we're, we're enthusiasts where this is something we, we care about. But one of the things I encourage when I talk to enterprises is that don't listen to only your noisy developers. Do a survey of all your developers and find out what they want if you're doing something about it. And what most of them want, I've done this now at two companies, 
They want to get their paycheck, do their job, get their bonus, and go home. And if they get their bonus and they get a good review, that's what they care about. They get a raise. They get like. The, the, but some of us, obviously, I care more about the doing the right thing and feeling that value. But I think we're outliers, and if we design systems for ourselves, we're designing it for one or two percent, and Even not everyone. Engagement with a lingerie manufacturer. <laughs> and uh, took their development team out to talk to the customers who were buying lingerie. And that was, that was quite an experience for all involved. <laughs> there was a fair bit of resistance early on for that field trip, but uh, it proved to be very valuable. But also, like, I've seen a lot of cases where the business is like, hiding the customers from the developers. Like, they, don't, they don't want the customers talking well, to the that, that is, and, that is, and Michael Cote and I, Cote and I did a, a series of podcasts about some of this, the, the divide between business and technology. It's because they, we hate each other. I mean, you've got, you've got the business that thinks that you have the arrogant developers, you have developers, and they think this business guys are stupid. And mm. uh, like, I, I think that's the driver of a lot of okay. it. So, so I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the panel back. We're going into <laughs> philosophical waters that I don't want to go into right now. Sorry, Mr. Moderator. Yeah. So... Actually, this is, a, this is a good opportunity, Garima, thank you. I want you to start off with your closing thoughts um, because we are unfortunately out of time, but we can continue the conversation in the hallway afterwards. So I would like to uh, say a few things, uh, two, two of them actually. So coming back to the discussion about you know, business and uh, contest delivery initiatives not aligned. I think we'll remain as second citizens uh, from a continuous delivery perspective if we do not connect ourselves back to the bigger picture. And how to do that? Like if we continue to measure, and this is something which I would challenge uh, the forum, that probably it's time for us to move beyond the measurement and matrices we have been looking from the past. Can we do a better uh, stab at it? Can we have uh, flow optimization, real time and dynamic you know, um, criteria to ensure that we measure the right things? And uh, then probably uh, we will have a better chance to succeed and we build a better connection towards our business stakeholders and probably become the first great citizens. Awesome, one minute. I love continuous delivery because I've seen over and over again that once you get over that hill of sort of activation energy, on the other side of that is a massively positive sum game where the people writing the software have a better life, the people operating the systems that the software developers make have a better life, the users of the software have a better life, and the people paying for the software have a better life. And like, there aren't very many games in business that are like so positive value that I've yeah. seen with continuous delivery. And so it's just, I'm so glad you're all here and I'm having a lot of fun. Thank you. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Uh, so I, 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 I agree with what my fellow panelists just said. I think the most important thing is uh, connecting things back to the business, choosing OKRs that are understandable by the business, that means something to them as well. In fact, I would probably do it just, an, I'd, I'd have my own metrics and then a net promoter score with, my, with, with the business. Just like, am I doing worse when, when I do this? Oh. And, but connecting things back to the company, remembering why we're doing this, um, and making sure that we add value. Oh, thank you. And th this is so great. We're ending up, ending the entire panel with the why, the purpose, the purpose behind mm -hmm. having CICD, the, especially the continuous delivery portion, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is using all this technology to improve the human quality of life, to reduce the pain, the manual toil, and the friction that people are going through, and so that people can go home and be happy and have lives. That's truly why we use technology. And so I want to thank you, panel, uh, for this great conversation. We'll be in the hallway, but I think we have one minute. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> yes, Lee. Does anybody have some spicy quips on like Westrom style organizations? Mm -hmm. Go. Some what? So like generative versus. Yeah. Uh, so you want me to talk yeah. about the three? Yeah, yeah. Go, go, go. Okay. So the uh, so Ron Westrom he was a, uh, a psychologist and he had this theory. He brought a taxonomy of 
uh, organizational culture. So there are three kinds. The first one is um, uh, it's a toxic culture. Um, <laughs> Pathological, yes, pathological. So it's very power oriented. Um, it focuses on punishing people who fail. Um, and then the next one is bureaucratic, which is very, very rule oriented. So in the rule oriented, you have a playbook for almost everything. You have manual intervention. And then um, if, in case you fail, you're pro probably scapegoated. Um, so that is this. But where you actually want to go and we want to go to is uh, the generative organization or a performance driven organization where everything is happy. It's like a utopia. You, if you fail or if you have an unintended outcome, you actually uh, investigate, you learn from it, you share the learnings and then people have a much higher level of psychological safety. And so the goal is to move from that pathological organization all the way up to a generative organization. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. To the Thanks for attending the panel. Thank you very much, Catherine.